فمن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا um, Let me begin my uh, presentation by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the one mighty uh, the one who uh, got us all together here uh, to converse and uh, dialogue and to talk to one another and to get to understand one another. Um, ignorance is the uh, substance which uh, the evil powers use to uh, get people fighting one another. And when you know uh, about other people, uh, you will certainly understand that there is no need for resentment or hate uh, because uh, God created us different, you know, God uh, designed that. Uh, he made us different and one way or another you don't really choose your parents, you don't choose your place of birth, uh, you don't choose the culture where you are brought up and it affects greatly your character and your development. You don't choose that. You don't have any choice regarding that. Yes, later on you're supposed to navigate because God giving you the faculties and the understanding that you should navigate your lives in a way that pleases Him. But certainly there are some things that we have no control over. And, you know, the, the best way to deal with this is uh, to dismiss any preconceived notions about other people and begin talking to them and understanding uh, what they are about and hopefully this will make you comfortable uh, with who they are and will make your experience um, pleasant. Yeah. I was asked to, uh, you know, uh, introduce Islam to you through the characters of uh, the messengers, uh, Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him. And I will do that in, in a very short time. Uh, but I, I really want to involve, uh, a conver involve you in a conversation with me, question and answer. And I encourage all of you to uh, just record these questions and, and keep them saved some, somewhere. And, and, Regardless of the nature of the question, I'm willing to answer any question that you have, including, are you a terrorist? I'm, 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 I'm willing to address that today, and I will not be offended in any way. I understand the nature of that forum is educational, and uh, everyone is entitled to you know, receive an answer, and if I don't know it, I'll tell you I don't know it. Uh, but, you know, something about me, when I speak, I do not... Um, you know, uh, I think you're entitled to learn about Islam beyond me, beyond me. Uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm just one Muslim, so I'm not here to preach to you who I am and, and what I personally uh, harbor of beliefs. No, I am going to present you the beliefs of Muslims so you understand the religion, not me. So normally I rely on, on the classical way of presenting the religion, which is, I will say this is in the Quran, uh, which is the revelation, the book which we follow, or this is what the messenger said. Um, you know, sometimes I may give you my personal, uh, you know, opinion regarding the matter, but I will connect you or strive to connect you with the Muslims, with the religion with the literature of the religion, not with me uh, personally. So whatever I'm presenting here today is really Islamic views, not my personal uh, views in a way. So his name is Muhammad. And again, he didn't choose his name. He didn't choose his place of birth. He is actually, um, you know, uh, uh, one of the uh, offspring of a very uh, known, highly regarded, respected character in Judaism, in Christianity, and in Islam. He's actually an offspring of Ibrahim, the biblical uh, name Ibrahim. That's 
And if you go, if some of you, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have at least attempted to read the Bible, the Old Testament, the first book, the book of Genesis, at one stage, Ibrahim or Ibrahim had a wife whose name is Sarah. And Sarah was barren. She could not bear children for Ibrahim. And somehow they went to Egypt to get some provision because there was drought in Palestine. So they returned with a maid, an Egyptian maid. Her name is Hagar. So Sarah, out of the generosity of her heart, knowing that her husband is a prophet of God, a messenger, and normally, you know, he wants to pass on that message of monotheism to the generation after him. And really the best person to instill that message uh, in is your own child. So she knew that Ibrahim or Ibrahim is longing to have a son who can inherit his prophethood after him. So she said to him, marry my maid, I'm barren. Go into my maid and marry her. You may have the child you're looking for. So Hagar married Ibrahim and she conceived right away. She became pregnant and she delivered a baby boy called Ishmael. Called Ishmael. Later on, Sarah felt the jealousy and her jealousy coincided with the command that came to Ibrahim from God to move Hagar and her baby to another location. And he chose that location to be Mecca, which is in Saudi Arabia. So Ibrahim took Hagar and Ishmael all the way to Mecca, and he placed them there. Of course, Ishmael married, that's where the Arabs used to live. He married from the Arab culture. And he taught them and Ibrahim the worship of the one God. And Muhammad is from that line. So if you trace back the lineage of Muhammad, it goes all the way to Ibrahim. Meaning he is a brother of Isaac because Ismail is the brother of Isaac. We understand that later on, because God wanted to reward Sarah for her compassion towards her husband and for her good heart, he actually later on given her a baby called Isaac. And Isaac and Ishmael are brothers. You see, from Isaac came Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Aaron, David, Solomon, Zechariah, John the Baptist, and Jesus. That's the line of Isaac. And we as Muslims, by the way, and some of you may be surprised, we actually believe in all these prophets and messengers. We believe that they are messengers of God, noble people. God chose in them in order to teach people the worship of one God and to be just and fair to one another, to treat one another with justice, with fairness, and to worship God alone. So they came all the way until Jesus to call people to the worship of the one God. Later on, God chose Ishmael with the final revelation through his offspring, and that was Muhammad. So Muhammad is actually a messenger to all of mankind. His message became universal. And again, he is inviting people to the same exact thing that all these messengers I named, and more than that, more than that actually, there are, there are 124,000 prophets sent to mankind, again, to bring them back to the worship of the one God 
and to teach them to be just and fair. The people in the Arabia, which is Mecca, which you would call Saudi Arabia now, that's the place, Saudi Arabia, they kept the tradition of Ibrahim and Ishmael for years, which is the worship of one God. We call this monotheism. The worship of one God, which is the first command in the Ten Commandments. And we believe that Jesus came to invite people to the worship of one God. But at one stage, they started actually introducing idolatry, idol worshiping. They actually started making shapes of gods. They placed it in front of them and they would pray to these gods. So right away, when this happens in a society, in a community, rest assured that injustice will spread. Corruption will spread. That's what we know. That's what we learn from history. They started now, after committing that major act of disobedience, which is really denying the Creator his right to be worshipped, and giving that to created beings, idols, which you shape with your own hands, then certainly corruption will spread. Imagine the top of the line of corruption in the Arabic community at this time, that when a father has his wife delivers, imagine this, and when he learns that the baby is a girl, he would take her alive and he would bury her alive. This is the top of the line. Add to killing whims and desires, gambling, and, you know, wickedness. A society that is consumed in their own desires and whims and regardless how much it takes to fulfill this, we don't care. So Muhammad was brought up in that environment. It's a very weird environment. You know, we believe that God fashioned and shaped us that we're able to recognize what is right from what is wrong. And, you know, we, we, if you actually study the religion carefully from Adam until Muhammad, it teaches something. And I don't know if, how many of you still recall that um, slogan that Microsoft introduced a while back, until inside. You still recall that? Until inside. Actually, inside every human being, there is that antenna that you can know where is the truth from falsehood. You know it, your sense. We call it fitrah. We call it inclination. That when you see the truth, you know it's the truth. This is the right thing. This, this matches. Uh, you know, it's exactly when you, when you go and, and, and buy uh, end user software. And, and I, you know, I'm trying to use some IT language here because I'm certain a lot of you are going for IT even though you're sitting in... So, so, uh, so, what, what is it? Sociology class, huh? But I know a lot of you are going into IT. You know, when you go and install that software into your computer, what is the software looks for? For it to be installed. A matching what? Component in the CPU. For it, otherwise, it's going to ask you to go and get it from the, fac uh, the factory again. Likewise, you know, Allah created us that we're able to recognize the truth. You know, that's not right. You know, how can you make sense of a God who's created like you? And you worship that God and you ask him to help you? Does this make sense? It doesn't make any sense. God must be greater than, you, than this. God is the creator of everything. He's not created. God is perfect. All things which are created in one way or another are imperfect. 
they have some deficiencies in them. And this is why rational reasoning, you should not be doing this. So Muhammad found himself in that environment. He couldn't merge. He couldn't just mix with it. You know, when you, you feel like a stranger, when you're a good person and, and you see people are doing wrong things around you and no one is saying no to it and everybody's just following the flow or going with the flow, at this stage you just pause and stop and you say, what? No, let me think about this. You know, there's something wrong here. This doesn't make any sense. So he decided to seclude himself from the society completely towards يعني, uh, the age of 40. He has never engaged in any of the practices which they used to do. He never worshipped idols. He never actually drunk, got drunk, or he never committed adultery. He never gambled. He just stayed away from this. Uh, you, you know that, that, that thing that, uh, you know, when, when, when you don't agree with people smoking drugs, for example, and you find yourself sitting there, even though you know that, you know, that's their free will, they get to do whatever they want to do. But here you are, you're sitting there and you're telling yourself, well, I don't belong here, you know, that's not my crowd, you know, it's, it's you know, that the, the soul doesn't agree with that, even though you're physically present, but your soul doesn't accept that. You, you feel like I'm, that's not my style, you know, I don't belong here. You know, you feel like a stranger in that environment. And that's how Muhammad was for 40 years. Towards the end of, of his seclusion, he actually des decided to stay for days on the top of a mountain in Mecca, just in complete seclusion. Then later on, he tells us, and I'm speaking like a non-Muslim now, even though I believe 100% that this happened, that he was contacted by an entity a body, another body, another person. He actually came to him in the cave and he said to him, read. That's actually the first word revealed in the Quran, in the revelation. He said to him, I can't read. And he actually was illiterate. He was unable to read. So he told him, read in the name of God who created. Of course, Muhammad was terrified by the experience. And he went down the mountain running, scared to death. And I understand that some of you may be married and they will know what I'm talking about. And some of you will marry soon. You know, the person who knows you best is the person who sleeps with you at night. And I, I, I mean by sleeping with you is you know, laying down, not what you have in mind. Laying down next to you at night. Those are, he knows you or she knows you the best. You can pretend out there in front of the people and introduce a character different than, uh, th th this is why Muhammad himself, when he spoke of having a good character, he said, the best of you in character are those who are best to their wives. Why? Because that's the person you spend most of the time with. You see, I come here, spend an hour with you. I don't have a hard time just smiling and putting that plastic face for an hour and I'll, I'll leave. Oh, this guy is so nice. If you really want to find out how nice I am, ask my wife. That's how you should find that. So when he came down the mountain, in the Arabian tradition, they believed in another race, which is true. Actually, the, the, the Quran tells us that it's correct. There is another race beside the angels, beside the human race, another race which we do not see, which is the race of Satan. They are called jinn. And a lot of these are evil spirits. And we believe actually as Muslims that they whisper to you that when you have an evil thought, it normally comes to you from that, you know, entity that they try to get you in trouble. 
They tell you, go and steal that thing. Why don't you go and do that? We actually, you see, when you have a good thought, it normally is triggered or stemmed by an angel. But again, they don't act on their own. That's why we don't believe or we don't pray to the angels. They act upon the command of God. And that's why we just worship God. And God can direct these good forces to help you. But if you don't worship God, if you do not obey God, if you don't align with God, these evil forces are normally are released to attack you and to get you in trouble. And the only way for you to protect yourselves from these evil forces out there, which you do not see, but they are forces that comes and whispers in your chest, uh, instigate you to do bad things. So Muhammad assumed that this person who contacted him was one of these evil forces. He said, this must be an evil. Immediately, and that's why I brought up that thing about your wife and, and she knows you the best. Immediately his wife said to him, no way. No way someone like you will be visited by such a force. Look what she said. You stand for the truth. You're good to your family. You're generous to your guests. You help the destitute. And when there is someone who is wrong, you stand out there for them. That, that's not the type of a person who will be visited by an evil source. But Khadija wanted to comfort him. That's the name of his wife, by the way. She used to have a relative who also did not like what the Arabs were doing. And he decided to become a Christian. He didn't like what the Arabs were doing. That's wrong. So he actually was a follower of Christianity. And he was very well informed of the Old and the New Testament. As soon as Muhammad, peace be upon him, shared with him the experience that he had on the top of the mountain, he immediately said to him, listen, this is the same entity, Gibrael, the archangel Gibrael, who visited Moses and Jesus. And I think you are the messenger that is prophesied in the Old and the New Testament, who will come out of the Arabs, out of the Arabia, out of the descendants of Ishmael. And you better be prepared because you're going to face a lot of resistance because you're coming to change society. And people who change societies normally are combated, normally are challenged, normally are resisted by the society and the people who are benefiting from the corrupt environment. You see, when there is corruption, where there is injustice, there are people who are benefiting from this, from the status quo. And normally are th those are the people who will use the resources to fight out anyone who is coming to reform the society. Uh, Muhammad, later on, he was commanded to go and let people know that worshiping idols is wrong. This is number one. You should worship the one and only, the mighty one, the one supreme God that no one else is like him. Once it comes to his divine essence, once it comes to his names, once it comes to his attributes, once it comes to his action. And he started introducing God to the people that these idols which you worship, which you make with your own hands cannot be gods. It can't be gods because they are created like you. And guess what? You're the one who created them. How can you worship something that you made with your own hands? It doesn't make any sense. But of course, in Mecca, in particular, this was a business. You see, it's very dangerous when religion is coupled with money. You know, when, when you have someone who is trying to guide people, and at the same time, it's a money-making 
And, and this is one of the, the unique things that we read about messengers and prophets like Muhammad. One of the things which they will tell the people, listen, I'm not doing this for work. I'm not asking you for anything. I'm not asking you for any income or uh, we actually in Islam, we believe that prophets and messengers are not to be inherited. The financials which they use, leave behind them are not to be inherited by their children. So the people also would not assume that these guys are just trying to accumulate wealth for their own kids. They are doing this purely for God and no other incentive out there. So when you have Mecca at this time, they used to host actually 360 idols for each tribe in the Arabia. And imagine Muhammad and the people would come every year bringing money, bring in sacrifice to their idols in Mecca, in the place where Muhammad is to tell the people this is wrong. So of course he was faced with resistance out of this world. He was persecuted, him and his followers. He was actually beaten up. Some of his followers actually were killed. We as preachers in the Muslim faith, by the way, when we address our Muslim congregation right now at the era of Trump and the era of Islamophobia and the Islamophobes, we remind them with that era. We tell them, come on, look what your messenger was faced with. Look what your, uh, you know, the, the followers of the messengers were faced with. What's wrong with you? Can't you be patient? You have to be patient. You have to stay like this. But in any rate, at one stage, Mecca was not a good host for Muhammad and his followers at all. Look at this very interesting piece now. Jews used to live in a very wealthy place in the Arabia, a country called Yemen. Yemen. Who heard of Yemen? Still exists. Sheba. That's Saba. It used to be a kingdom at the time, and it used to be very wealthy. And they used to have a dam there, and the, 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 the broke, and, and somehow they ran out of water. So Jews looked for a place to live in. Imagine this. And those were the most familiar people from the Jewish faith of the Old Testament. They chose a place in the Arabia, in the Arabian Peninsula, called Medina or Yathrib, because the description of that city fits exactly what they have in the Old Testament, that this is the place the messenger from the line of Ishmael will migrate to because he will not be treated well in his hometown. They will expel him. They will fight him. They will actually try to kill him. And they actually try to do this. So when they were living there, they would actually share that information with the Arabs who would go every year, like I said a minute ago, in order to give respect to their idols in Mecca. Listen, guys, we're waiting for this messenger. He will come out and he will lead us Jews. Of course, the Jews somehow assume that he's ex exclusive to them, that this messenger from the line of Ishmael will be theirs only, not a universal one. So Muhammad, peace be upon him, would take advantage of that season when all these tribes in the Arabian Peninsula would convene and gather to pay respect for their idols in the vicinity of Mecca. And he would go around and request any of these tribes to take him and host him and his followers because they can do it here in Mecca so that he can convey the message. Because his own people, his own family are not 
very welcoming of him. Coincidentally, there is nothing called coincidentally, but this is the decree of God. He ended up contacting the same people who used to live next to the Jews. And they always kept hearing the Jews talking about the time for this messenger to emerge is now. All the signs are there in the Old Testament and the New Testament about the emerging of this messenger and he will migrate to that place. So those people who immediately when he addressed them, they said to one another, this is the messenger. Our neighbors, the Jewish community are talking about all the time. And we better be fast in supporting him so he can help us instead of them. That's sometimes how things would work. They immediately offered him a place. He migrated him and his followers and he established the first Muslim entity in the face of this earth, in this town, which harbored Jews, some Christians and Muslims. And they were living together under one banner and there was no compulsion and everyone is entitled to his right now he is to defend that little entity if he is attacked and this is why there is war in his biography is exactly when you attack a country this country is entitled to defend themselves and he did that and that is why but again Islam teaches us the manners and the rules of engagements even when you fight someone in a declared war Fa later on he became victorious he actually marched back to his hometown and they all accepted Islam and his religion became the predominant religion in the Arabian Peninsula. After he passed away, after he died, his followers brought that message to all of Bergia and some parts of the Western Christian world, which we call the Roman Empire, all the way to Egypt, all the way to Syria, all the way to Jerusalem and parts of Turkey and later on all of Turkey and it actually went all the way to uh, some of uh, Serbia, some of Sarajevo and Albania and uh, of course the people from the Moroccan side went into Spain and into Portugal but Muslims decided you know that this is a good thing, so let's go back and abandon the religion and, 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 and they started, uh, you know, uh, disobeying and, and going back to their own uh, little, you know, cultural practices and so forth. And this is uh, why the religion is in, in that condition which we're facing right now. But again, I go back to the characters. Here is... Here is the testimony of the first Jewish rabbi who saw Muhammad. And by the way, uh, something about the, the biography of Muhammad or his life, the story of his life, it is detailed to the littlest. Why? You know what is the wisdom behind this? Because the Quran, which is the book which we follow as Muslims, is different to all the books that which were re revealed before it. The Old Testament, the New Testament. We call the Old Testament the Torah. We call the New Testament Il Injil, the book which Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, was given. These books were revealed at once. So a whole book is given to the messenger, one delivery, one time. The Quran, no. 
The Quran was revealed in 23 years. And this is the time the Prophet took to establish the religion in the Arabian Peninsula. And a lot of these verses were revealed in connection to his life. He would do something, God would agree with it, God would reveal things, this is good. God doesn't agree with it, no, you can't do that, do that. So it was kind of reaction between earth and heaven. And this is why for us Muslims to understand the Quran, one of the prerequisites to interpret and understand the Quran, I must study the biography of the Prophet. I must know his life. At least the 23 years, not the 40 years. He lived 62 years. I'm more interested in the 22 and some month years. The 40 years, yeah, it helps. And I shared with you in, 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 in summary, some of it. But for me to understand the revelation, I must go back. And this is why the character of the Prophet, when his wife was asked about his manner and his character, you know how she answered the questioner? She said to him, did you read the revelation? Yes, that's how he was. He was a walking Quran. That's the translation for her words. He implemented the revelation in himself that you could see the manner and the godly attributes. Of course, he is not divine. We don't believe that. He's a human being. And he is not to be worshipped beside God. He actually warned us against this. Because people would fall in love with his characters. Come on. I mean, who amongst you read the book of Michael Hart? You know, he, when he listed those hundred most influential characters in the face of the in the, in the in the in the history of humanity he came number one i mean regardless of who's michael hart is for you but here is the testimony of the first jewish rabbi when the prophet muhammad migrated from his hometown to the place where he established Islam initially and became that entity. I don't want to use that word Muslim state, you know, because that word state is a, you know, is, is a very, you know, Muslim state is, is ISIS and all that stuff. You know, that's why I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I'm using the word entity not to scare you. <laughs> it's like, you know, the media sometimes, you know, just get you, uh, you know, and, and, and cornered basically. But the point I'm trying to make here, when he migrated, this man was the most knowledgeable of the Jewish community of the Torah. He immediately said, I want to go and check this man out. When I arrived, I found him surrounded by his followers. I looked at his face and I can tell you that this is a face of someone who does not lie. His eyes are not the person who would lie. And here is the first words that I heard coming out of his mouth, asking his congregation to do. Oh, my followers, look at this. Afshu salam, spread peace, be peaceful. Atta'imu ta'am, feed the hungry. When you see somebody hungry, feed them. Silul arham. Uphold your kinship ties. And connect with God at night. Sallu bil-layli wa nasu niyam. Pray at night while people are asleep. This will give you peace and tranquility in this world. And you will be admitted into the everlasting abode in the hereafter, which is, we call it heaven. This is the way to success. Imagine, this is what he heard. These are the words that came out of his mouth. And if you read his biography, when he was living in Mecca, 
And the word got circulated around the Arabian Peninsula. One of his disciples, who later on accepted the religion of Islam, by the way, his name is Abu Dhar, he was like him. He used his intellect, his reasoning, his inclination, and he said, there is no way that God can be confined in that little rock, which we shape with our own hands. And, but he heard that this man is calling to the worship of the Almighty. So he had a brother, and he called upon him and he said, my brother, I can't travel to Mecca because I have work to do. Can you do this favor for me? Can you go and watch this man that who claims to be a prophet, claims to be a messenger? Just watch him. Who is this guy? He went and he spent 10 days like a surveillance camera watching him. You know, he went back to his brother and he submitted a report made of one sentence. I saw a man who is commanding good character. Good character. Be merciful. Be nice. Be merciful to your parents who brought you up in this world. Imagine a man came to him and asked him, who is the one person who deserves my kindest, kindest, best, best, best treatment? He said, Ummuk. Ummuk in Arabic, your mother. Then who? Ummuk. Then your mother. Then who? Ummuk. Three times. Your mother. Then who? Then your father. Because this is the woman who brought you into this world. He, he, he tells us that if you can't be grateful to the people, how are you going to be grateful to God? We don't see God. We can't see God in this world. So you want to be grateful to someone that you cannot see, recognizing his favors upon you. And meanwhile, someone who bore you, brought you into this world, nine months carrying you in her womb, delivering you. You can be nice to them. You can say thank you to them. Love, mercy, be merciful to them. He, he teaches us that, that you actually should invoke God. Oh Allah, oh God Almighty, be merciful to, to my parents like they have raised me when I was a little baby. They have taken care of me when I was unable to take care of myself. That's what he teaches us. He teaches us, by the way, to be loving to our own children. Imagine this. One day, he was sitting down, and one of the chiefs of the Arabian, uh, you would call him a president of a country now. The tribal system at his time was very similar to the uh, system that we have, like presidents of countries. Imagine one of the chiefs of the tribes came to see him and to talk to him. So while he's sitting with that president of one of the tribes in the Arabian Peninsula, his two grandchildren entered into the room. So he grabbed them and he kissed them. You see, Arabs, they have some weird things. They think that if you kiss a baby, that's, you're not what? You're not a man. You think that it's, you know, when you grab a baby and hug a baby, that's not a man enough. You're supposed to be a man, strong. So you're kissing a baby. So he looked at the prophet and he said, Atuqabbiluna subyanakum. You guys kiss your babies, your children? By Allah, that's a, an oath. By God, by the one mighty, I have 10 children. I have never kissed any of them one day. The prophet looked at him and he said, what I'm going to do to you if God has extracted mercy out of your heart? And he said to him, if you cannot show mercy, you can be shown mercy by God. So for you, 
to be shown mercy by your creator. You should show mercy to the created. He says, be merciful to those who are in earth. The one in the heaven will be merciful to you. That is his thing. Even to animals. Even to animals. And we have a fascinating story of a woman who used to commit adultery. Not only this, she used to fornicate for living. What we call now, and I'm sorry to use the term, prostitutes. A prostitute. He told us about this woman that one day she was traveling in the desert and she was so thirsty. She found a well of water. So she went down, it's one of these deep wells, and she took a drink. And when she went back up, she saw a dog licking a wet spot in earth out of thirst. The dog is so thirsty too. So she said, you know what? This dog is experiencing what I have experienced a while back. Here's what she did for her to bring water to that dog from the deep well. She took off her shoe. She went down, filled it with water. She placed the shoe in her mouth because that's the only way you're going to climb up. And she climbed up and she given that dog water to drink. In spite of her doing this act, which is awful in the sight of God, she still went to heaven, or she is to go to heaven, according to that, because she showed mercy to a dog, to an animal. And this is how we understand this, by the way, because some of you may assume that's nice. I could do whatever I want to do and all what I have to do, just get 10 dogs and just give them water. No, that's not how you understand this. Is you, you, you see, because of this act, God guided her to stop, to repent, to say no to it anymore. I'm not going to do this anymore. I want to be a good person. And she started becoming a devout person, a good person. You see, sometimes doing, you know, good things could be the reason for God guiding you back to him. And, and, and this is why, regardless, by the way, who you believe in, just do good things. And if the one mighty, and I'm going to tell you that story, but, you know, uh, uh, in a way, it's, 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 it's very harsh, but it, it gets the point across. Uh, this is in the Arabian culture, like uh, Mr. Nabil, uh, he is born in the Arabia. Abu Ghazala, but yet he's a Christian because he can force people. Listen, I'm here to invite you to Islam. I'm here to make you love the religion and hopefully accept it one day. But can I compel you? I can. Nobody can. No one can. One of these scholars used to travel they used to wake up early in the morning and walk to the mosque to observe the first prayer, which comes maybe 45 minutes before sunset. And in his way, he always finds this Christian woman waking up in the morning at the same time, taking seeds and feeding the birds. So every day, this Christian woman would wake up at the same time. He's going to pray, observe the first prayer in a mosque, which normally comes right now at this time, by the way, around five o'clock in the morning. Imagine you have to leave bed, something like 4.30 in order to make it to pray. So that early, you wake up that early and he would find this woman feeding the birds. 
The man was fanatic, you know, was one of these extremists, you would say. So he said, I mean, but he, that's what he believes. He said, listen, what you're doing is wonderful, but you have to believe in the one God for this to benefit you. And he would leave her. Every day he will tell her that sentence. And every day she will wake up to give seeds to the birds, food to the birds. Later on, years back, he's in Mecca. And every Muslim, by the way, if he's able to, has to go to Mecca once in a lifetime at least, if not more than that. So he was actually around, walking around the place, and he saw the same Christian woman there that tells him that she became Muslim. She became a Muslim. He immediately asked her, what brought you here? How come you're here? She said, you know what? Feeding the birds. So, like, this is what the Prophet teaches us. That be good to the creation, even to his enemies. During that phase when he was in his hometown, and they were persecuting, harming him and his followers, he decided instead of staying like this, let me go to the other town and let me ask them to take me in. So he went there and he said to them, listen guys, my own people cannot help me. Not only this, they are actually harming me. Can you guys host me and my followers so I can deliver the message God given to me? Listen to this. He was physically abused, emotionally, psychologically abused. When he walked out of that town, he said to himself, I was feeling so much down, hopeless, helpless. And the archangel Gabriel came in the company of another angel. And they said to him, listen, tell us if you want to destroy your enemies. We'll do it. God commanded us to follow your direction. God told us we should do whatever you're asking me to do. Would you like us to destroy them for you? He said, no, that's not what I'm here for. I just wish that one day their own children will accept they believe in one God and being just and fair to one another. That's what I'm calling people to. So his own enemies, he would not even wish for their destruction. I understand that when we read the biography of Muhammad, peace be upon him, we come across war and fighting. But again, this has to be understood in context of a war between two states or two entities, and it is declared war. It is not something that you do, like right now, you know, rules of engagement. And he would tell his army, don't kill children, don't kill women, don't destroy a tree, don't attack a monk worshiping in his sanctuary. Don't kill an animal. So the rules of engagement are taught. So when we read that text about his biography, uh, we have to understand this in context. But this is Muhammad, you know, in brief. Muhammad in brief. He was sent to invite mankind, all of them, to the worship of the one God and to worship him in a way that God already designed and he shown us how to do it. You don't make up your own forms of worship. This is too. And above all, to have a good character with your friends and with your enemies. You treat people the way that you like to be treated. Even if you resent them, he tells us 
Do not allow the resentment which you may harbor in your hearts toward someone to drive you to commit injustice against them. You have to be still fair, even towards a person that you may not like. So this is Muhammad in brief. And uh, I'm sure they told me I can speak as, as long as I want. But I always feel mercy. You know, I, I like to be merciful to the crowd. You know, I don't, I mean, here you are stranded and trying to get that extra credit. You know, he taught me to be merciful. So I'm not going to abuse you, inshallah. God من أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحاً.